The Holy Gospel for the day is taken from the seventh chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. We stand in reverence and in witness to the risen Christ who is in our midst. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray for the blessing of the word. Come, Holy One, fill this sanctuary with your splendor and your power, and settle over this word that our hearts would be open to hear from you. Let this word be your word to us today, Lord. Amen. Dirk was visiting his grandparents. Well, actually, his grandmother was babysitting for him. And like all four-year-olds, he was curious about everything. He followed her around all day long. And finally, he followed her into the bedroom where she was going to hang clothes in the closet. And when she opened the closet door, he said to her, Grandma, what is that room? And she said, it's a closet. And he said, we don't have closets at our house. And she said, of course you do. You have lots of closets in your house. But Dirk was insistent. They had no closets at his house. So Grandma decided that she'd find some other way to get at this question. And she said to him, well, where do you put all your clothes? And his answer was, in the dryer. (laughs) We don't always do everything the same way. We don't always do everything the same way as our parents do. Our children don't always do things the same way. You can still see it today. In Valley View, Alberta, There's a parallel fence, runs about a half mile, and the fences, two two lines of fences, I mean two sets of fences, and they're about two feet apart. It turns out that the two farmers that lived on those farms had a little feud. They began to have a serious feud. And one of them, Paul, wanted to build a fence between the two properties and share the cost of the fence. But Oscar said, no way, I'm not paying for any fence. You want a fence, you put the fence in. So after a few weeks, a fence went up right between those properties. And when it was completed, Oscar went over to Paul and said, I see we have a fence. And Paul said, what do you mean we? I paid for that fence. I had the land surveyed and I placed the fence exactly two feet on my side of the property line so that there's the fence and then there's two feet of my property on the other side, the outside of the fence. And he said, I want to warn you that if any of your animals put one foot on my property, I'm going to shoot them. And he was serious. And Oscar knew he was serious. So a couple years later, when it came to the time that he needed to use that pasture for his animals, he built his own fence exactly two feet from the original fence. Now, Paul and Oscar are both dead. But the fences remain as a testament 
to the all too common nature that we have to find reasons to reject others, to be self-centered about our needs, to find ways to reject someone because we don't like them or they're different or maybe just because we have a disagreement. It turns out that we live in a world that finds all kinds of ways to be disagreeable and all kinds of reasons to reject one another. I mean, honestly, how many people do you think get a sense of suspicion if they see an Arab-looking man in the mall whose wife walks behind him wearing a scarf? Or how many of us would be a little concerned and nervous if we were walking down a street and found that there was a group of black or Hispanic teenagers in the street in front of us? These things are in our world. They're around us all the time. When I was serving in Louisville, we had a family, the Trans, who came originally from Vietnam. They were Vietnamese political refugees because they'd been on our side during the war, and when the uh, communists took over, they were imprisoned and tortured, and then when they got out, they were continually harassed, so they got political refugee status, and they came originally to a uh, city in North Dakota because a Lutheran congregation there had sponsored them. But the climate was so different that they just couldn't stand the North Dakota winters, so they came to Louisville and settled there. The first week that they came to church, they apologized for me for having missed the preceding Sunday because they said they'd moved on that Saturday and they hadn't had time to find a church yet. Can you imagine being that faithful in your worship that you would apologize for missing one Sunday because you moved the day before? And they became very consistent, very wonderful members of the church, and literally everybody in the congregation loved them. We loved their food and their customs and their way of speaking, and when we would do the Lord's Prayer, you could always hear them way ahead of all the rest of us because they spoke much more quickly than we did. And I used to think, God is smiling, for this must sound so beautiful to the Lord. Because of my connection with them, I kind of got a connection with the Vietnamese community in South Louisville and became a little bit of an advocate for them. And one day I went with a Vietnamese couple to their insurance agent. They had paid their monthly premium and they had proof that they'd paid it, but the agency was saying that it had never been paid. Now you know how hard it is to get a snafu like that straightened out even when you have good English, right? But if you don't speak English well, that's not an easy one. So I went with them. We came into the office. We waited for quite a long time. They finally put us in front of a desk. We all three were sitting there. After a few minutes, the agent who had sold them the policy came and sat across from us in the desk. And he said to me, as if I were going to agree with him, I just hate it when we get these people in. They just can't drive. Now, this was not a visit that had anything to do with driving. They weren't making a claim. They had never made a claim. This was just about the fact that they'd paid the bill. And not only did he paint them with the same brush that he thought he had for other Vietnamese people, but he painted me with the same brush, thinking that because I was also white that I would agree with him on this point. You see how we do that? And it's not just ethnic and racial things that make us push people away who assume that they're different and therefore they're not trustworthy or we're afraid of them or something, but it's all around us in so many ways. People who make different choices in their lives or even, how about this one, the cl political climate. I mean, look at the political climate and you know that we do this. We keep one another at arm's length because we have differences. And that's, I think, what makes the gospel for today so challenging. It isn't challenging because it has a miracle in it. Any one of us who believe that Jesus is raised from the dead know that we have a God who can heal somebody even though they're not right there. I mean, that's not a problem. The miracle's no difficulty. <clears throat> the difficulty is in who gets healed. And understand that, you need to know a little bit more about this whole makeup of the story. The centurions were the mainstay of the Roman army. And that means that a centurion was not only an enemy, but an occupying enemy. They were really quite hated by the Jews. And so he's um, already got one strike against him. 
A centurion was named for the fact that he was the commander of what was called a century. Did you know that that's the origin of that word? A century was a hundred soldiers, and that's how he got his name. Centurion commands a, a century, a hundred men. And there were 60 centuries in a legion. And a legion then is about 6,000 men. It means that the centurion in his day-to-day -day living is a very powerful man. He is not only in charge of 100 men, but he's got some charge over 6,000 men. We also know that the centurions were veterans. There was none of them but that became centurions unless they were um, seasoned veteran soldiers, and that meant that they were highly respected by others. And not only that, they made on average 15 times what the average foot soldier made. So by their standards, they were relatively wealthy. So here you have this powerful, well-respected, well-positioned, wealthy guy. And we also know that the centurions in mass didn't come to Galilee until the year 44 AD, and this is much earlier than that. So that tells us that this centurion was almost certainly part of Herod Antipas' entourage. Now remember, Herod also was the enemy of the people. They didn't like him. They had no time for him. And probably what the centurion did was something like palace guard, policemen or customs. In other words, we have the image here of a man who is truly an outsider. He's powerful and wealthy and has position, but according to the Jews, he is an outsider. We also discover that he is a very compassionate man. We hear this because the Jews come and they say that he's done many good things for them. That caring for the Jewish community was really rare, and it probably means that he was also a God-fearer. That is to say, he had converted to Judaism, but he had just never taken the step of being circumcised. So he's a believer, and he loves the God of Israel, but he never became a full member of the community. And they also say, he built our synagogue for us. That reflects the Roman uh, idea of patronage, where a wealthy person would do something for a client, and the client would then become loyal to them. That's what's happening here. The elders come, and they are being loyal to their patron, and so they broker with Jesus to get Jesus to do what they want. Then the centurion says these powerful words, I am not deserving of a visit from you, Jesus. And in that, he is reversing the tables. He is putting himself in the position of not patron, but client. He's now going to be the client, and Jesus is going to be his patron. And it tells us some very powerful things. One thing it tells us is that he is willing to be loyal to Jesus. That's an incredible thing, if you think about it. It also means that he recognizes that Jesus has even more authority and power than he has. It's just startling on the face of it that this powerful man who was considered to be an enemy and who has all this stuff on his table would come and yield himself in power and authority to a traveling rabbi. And he understands the nature of Jesus' authority as well. He says, I know that when I give an order, if I tell you to go, you go. And if I say to you, come, you come. People do what I say. And I don't have to stand on top of them to get them to do it. And he knows that Jesus is the same way. What he's saying there about Jesus is I recognize that your authority is even greater than mine. And because he's a God-fearer, it almost certainly means that he recognizes that the authority that Jesus had comes from God. Now that makes him in a class all by himself at the time. And that's why Jesus says his faith is better than all the faith that he's found in Israel. Because here is this outsider who shouldn't really have known the power and authority of Jesus, and yet he recognizes it against those Israelites who should have known that Jesus was who he said he was. They had their whole Old Testament scriptures to look at. They had all these instances that described Messiah and Jesus fit them to a T and they don't recognize who he is. They don't see his authority, but this outsider gets it. And not only that, he is not even asking for himself. He is asking for his servant, 
for a slave, a person even lower than he is in the whole scheme of alienation from the Jews, a person that could have easily been replaced. Why didn't he just let that guy die and get another slave and put him in there? Because he has the same kind of agenda that Jesus has. He's the one with faith, and Jesus recognizes it. The text reveals powerful things to us. It reminds us that we have a God who is inclusive, who embraces those that we may not embrace, even those that some of us might call enemy. And this God of embrace invites all of us to have faith. And when you boil life down to its base, you discover that the one thing that we have in common with each other is our love for Jesus. We don't have to look alike. We don't have to believe all the same things. We don't have to be the same political party. We don't have to be on the same page about everything. But what we have in common is our love for Jesus and our faith in what God is doing through him. And if anybody if the, among those Jewish groups had known that, they never would have put him on the cross. You see, that's what's missing. And that's what we are to have. So that we will love whoever he loves. Sally was in seminary, and she was taking a class from Professor Smith. And Professor Smith had a reputation for his object lessons. So one day she came into class and she noticed a big target on the wall right in front of her. And they all sat down in their chairs and Professor Smith asked them all to take out a piece of paper and draw a picture of someone that they didn't like, someone they liked to get even with, or someone they hated, someone they had disdain for. And they all got busy and drew pictures. Sally drew a picture of somebody that she had a particular hatred for. And when the pictures were all drawn, The professor had them come up one by one and um, thumbtack their drawings right over top of the target. And then the picture that was in the front, he got that student to come up and he handed him darts and he said, now toss those darts at this person that you hate. Darts go flying. Some of those darts went so hard and so fast that it tore the pictures a little bit even. But one by one, each student threw the darts. And every time a student was finished, Professor Smith would go over, take their picture down, hand the darts to the next person. So it went all through the class until finally Sally's turn was up and she was the last person in line. She got up, took the darts ready to throw, and he said, now Sally, I want you to sit down. And she was really angry and disappointed. She was really ready to just let go and get some of that anger and frustration out. But the professor had her sit down. And as she's sitting in her chair fuming, Professor Smith walked over and he took her picture down off the wall. And then he took the target down off the wall. And the whole class gasped because under that picture of the target was a picture of Jesus. And all those nail holes had gone into his face. One eye was torn out. The skin was ripped in the picture of Jesus. He said only one thing. Whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. So before we begin to decide that someone is not worthy of being in our presence, before we begin to eliminate people because they're different than we are and they have different ideas or they look different, before we begin to name people as inappropriate to be in our midst, we maybe should remember who stands behind them. And perhaps we should remember that the one who stands behind them loves them with the same love that he loves us.